There are some games that just click with me instantly. Within two minutes, I'm already all in and ready for what comes ahead. Katana Zero was not one of those games. In fact, when I first played Katana Zero on my Switch, I didn't even get past the halfway point and it took me three play sessions to even get there. I was just not that impressed with what it offered and fell off it quickly. About a year later though, I saw the game pop up on Xbox Game Pass and thought, you know what, what the hell, let me give it another shot, and for some reason, this time around, I got really into it. After a few days of playing it for short bursts at a time, I rolled credits and thought, you know what, that game was really good, I don't know what I was smoking last time. Which brings us to last night, where I thought to myself, you know, I'm in a weirdly Katana Zero type mood today, let me boot it up, and three hours later I sat there once again watching the credits roll by thinking, this game was actually amazing, and I think something might have hit my head a bit too hard a few years back because I clearly wasn't in a healthy mental state at the time. This kind of stuff happens sometimes, for some reason you're just not feeling something and then suddenly you give it another chance and fall in love. It's not even restricted to games, I've done the same thing with movies like Dunkirk and shows like Always Sunny, but it got me thinking about why exactly I had such a huge shift in my opinion. Did my taste change? Was I in a different mood? Did certain games I played in between have an effect on what I was open to? Probably yes to all three but crucially, I think Katana Zero is designed to get better every time you play it. Maybe not to the extreme degrees of my situation, sure, but certainly to some extent. But how does it pull that off? I absolutely love one-hit kill games. The constant danger and satisfying executions of a game where everything, including you, dies if a light gust of wind comes through the door is exhilarating. And some of my other favorite examples of these games, outside of Katana Zero, are Ghost Runner and of course, Hotline Miami. Like those games, Katana Zero abides by a pretty simple checklist which ensures it remains fast-paced and limits frustration as much as it can. Keep level resets as short as humanly possible, with Katana Zero also adding a little bit of a flare with the rewind effect. Create multiple pathways for dealing with densely packed encounters, provide a stream of tools for planned attacks or last ditch Hail Marys, focus on tough but short encounters, and make every hit feel awesome. Instead of abusing cover or slowly chipping away at enemies while playing passively, movement, quick planning, and aggression are paramount to succeed in these games. A lot of the time it's significantly safer to slam a door open and bum rush a gun-toting henchman with complete disregard than it is to stay back and try to avoid attacks. Sometimes even deflection when slowing down time is a bad idea since a second bullet can still whack you. For new players, that might be a bit of a hard adjustment to trust your speed and instincts over safe positioning and controlled environments which can slow down this game that's otherwise designed to put you in a flow state of ninja action, but that's why subsequent playthroughs are so rewarding. Once you know the game can't hurt you and you've been partially conditioned to favor aggression over passivity, you become in control, and now instead of being a glass cannon cowering in fear from the bad men that can slice you up in an instant, you barely give them a chance to breathe in your direction before their insides splash against the drywall. I honestly think Katana Zero imbues this sense of confidence over its runtime much better than a game like Hotline Miami, which features enemies with sensitive hearing and level design that's full of little rules rooms and walls designed for cover, which leads to a lot of running away, hiding, and shotgunning as enemies pile in through the doorway. Here though, once you open a door, chances are you're a straight shot from everything that's bound to kill you, and the only cover you'll find is far more dangerous to get to than your enemies are, so you're kinda just forced to deal with what's in front of you. Of course, some of that intensity is removed when you have that handy dandy slow down time ability, which does have a limit, but it's pretty generous. But once again, this strengthens future playthroughs where you might think to yourself, you know, I think I'm gonna use that ability less this time. Maybe not ditch it entirely, but use it strategically instead of as a crutch. In doing so, every level feels like you get shot out at a high velocity. The more momentum you have in every encounter, the more momentum you have with the game as a whole. Which is why my first and second playthrough were cut up in chunks where I thought, alright, this seems like a natural stopping point, I'll boot it back up tomorrow. And my most recent playthrough was done in one single sitting, because there was no natural stopping point. It was all just move, 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 and what made me shine through the most given that mentality was just how much variety this game had. <laughs> Katana Zero throws out new mechanics like I throw out my will to live. Constantly. There's so many new ideas every few minutes that somehow the amounts of Katana Zero per Katana Zero is greater than one. Think about it. This game's replay value absolutely skyrockets due to its variety alone. There are 11 levels in Katana Zero, and all of them can be completed in under 10 minutes if you've mastered the game. With the first level showing you basic combat and dodging, the second letting you move between background and foreground and introducing throwable objects, the third taking place at a nightclub which you initially sneak through and blend in with and then eventually pass by again when fighting enemies, 
enemies. The fourth has a bloody trail to follow and a police response to deal with afterwards. The fifth has multiple floors that are accessible via elevator, one of which leads you to an on-rail section where you hop on and off a cart. The sixth incorporates a bit of a chase, has two bosses and puts you on a motorcycle. Seven has police entrances and explosive drones. Eight, you play as the dragon who has a different moveset. Nine has a sniper rifle, hydraulic presses, and a gauntlet it puts you through. Ten has a descending elevator that leads you to tough but straightforward encounters. And eleven is a pretty difficult, normal level that incorporates a lot of what you've learned capped off with the final boss. None of this is formulaic, stale, or repetitive. There's always a new gimmick, a new tool, and a new design choice around every corner. After my most recent playthrough, I actually gave the speedrun a quick try, and without even putting any elbow grease into the whole process, I closed out at a bit over an hour, which means that I averaged about 7 minutes per level. Just think about how many additions I rattled off there, and they could potentially change every 7 minutes. Of course, that probably won't happen your first time through. How long to beat.com puts this game at about 4.5 hours to beat, which means every level takes on average 25 minutes. But couple it with the flow and movement you get when playing a game like this for the second or third time, and you really start to see just how concentrated and creative Katana Zero is. A lot of my favorite games don't have big skill trees that give you new abilities to keep things fresh. They give you a small set of tools and build around that in new ways. New enemy types, new momentary power-ups, new settings, and new bosses, and Katana Zero is a fantastic embodiment of that. The problem that you may run into, though, is that it's sometimes hard to appreciate that creativity when it's constantly on repeat, on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. <laughs> Katana Zero's levels are meant to simultaneously feel like an impromptu dance where you narrowly escape death and solve problems on the fly, as well as a planned attack that intelligently uses your tools in an ideal way. And while you probably start most encounters on your first playthrough with way more of this than you have of this, after a couple of quick deaths and resets, plans can begin to form even subconsciously, and you can end up with a healthy medium where you both feel skilled and smart for clearing out these hallways. Of course, sometimes you clear areas without deaths or after a whole lot of dying, which means you might lean a bit too far to one side or another. Something that's not exactly awful, but can sometimes negatively affect how you view the game. I found that in my first playthrough, I sometimes felt like it was too easy, and sometimes felt like I was stuck in the same 20 second loop for ages. Not even because the game had a bad difficulty curve, in fact, after playing it again, I can safely say it has one of the better designed difficulty curves I've ever seen, but because sometimes I'd get lucky or rely on the slowdown time ability and bumble my way to the exit, and other times I'd be so dead set on a plan that wasn't working that I'd put myself in a corner. My lack of experience with games of this nature and my approach to encounter was definitely a burden on me in the first go around, but what's awesome about a game that's built off repeating stages and balancing intuition and intelligent play is that every time you go back to it, even after a good chunk of time has passed, you are starting at a much more balanced place. All of a sudden, on my most recent playthrough, even though I remembered none of the level layouts or even the controls at first, I absolutely zipped through it with relative ease while also problem solving and making the most out of my tools on the fly. Within about 10 seconds from starting this level, I went from trying to brute force this section right here to realizing that I could return this bullet angle this drone into explosive barrels, and land on this dude to cut him up in a single jump, and it made me so much more appreciative of the level design. It no longer felt like I was dealing with a random assortment of junk that I was haphazardly using and abusing to eke out victories. Now, I was quickly understanding what enemies were giving me a problem and how to deal with them without blinking an eye. Okay, I've done two runs chucking these bottles up here for quick kills and then running into trouble with the gunmen below. Why don't I grab this bottle, kill these melee dudes normally, and then use the bottles to snipe the shooters before I get close to them? Simple. When you go through everything for the first time, unsure of what's coming next, constantly being introduced to new mechanics and not possessing the confidence to face goons head on, sometimes getting through levels can feel frustrating, and sometimes it feels like you got blessed by RNGesus, not really earning your victory. That's just something that might happen with some players when you rely on repetition. That doesn't make it bad game design, and it certainly doesn't mean that everyone will hate it the first time that they play it, lots of people clicked with it instantly. But what everything I've mentioned here does mean is that nearly everyone, whether they loved it or hated it the first time, Time, will appreciate it even more the next time, and the next time, and the next time. A lot of games lose their muster on replays, and a select few can maintain that excitement the second time around, but Katana Zero is one of the only games where it feels like my enjoyment increases each time. Replaying games almost always means you get through things faster, you can plan things easier, and you can get a better grasp on how much variety the game has, but a lot of the time, those aren't necessarily good things, or at least not good enough to match up against a fresh, blind playthrough. Beating that boss in four tries 
prize instead of the 50 attempt bout of the century might not be as satisfying. Mowing through groups might make you feel powerful, but not challenged. Knowing exactly how to deal with most situations takes away the learning process, and you might start realizing that the game's new ideas are stretched really thin. It's always fun to replay stuff, but nothing can match that first time through. That's why a lot of people always say, oh man, I wish I could go back to playing this game for the first time. But everything that a replay brings to the table is exactly what makes Katana Zero more fun. You want to get through it faster, you want to be more aggressive, you want to be able to plan moves as a reflex, and you want to see the next thing in this short but dense experience. And how appropriate is it that in a game where repetition is not only a mechanic but a motif and a major part of the story, you're only able to get the most out of it by playing it over and over and over again. It might not be alone in that idea, there may be plenty of other games that I still love booting up every so often, but if I'm gonna make playing Katana Zero a yearly thing, I gotta say, I think I'm even more excited for my replay in 2024 than I am for 2023s. And it's pretty unbelievable that a game that I found too boring and too inconsistent to finish is now one of the most unique and best games I've ever played. <laughs>